Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Here to welcome you to Joshua Lunas' uh, dissertation defense. This has been an exciting project to see unfold, and it's truly a pleasure to accompany someone like Josh through a process of writing a dissertation. Uh, my name is Bradley Wilson. For those of you who don't know me, um, we have a lot of folks here in the room um, who are close friends of Josh. I want to thank you and welcome you to the Department of Geology and Geography. Also, I'd like to welcome those who are joining us via Zoom. Um, this is the first defense that I've been to um, in which some of the research participants in the study are on Zoom to witness the defense itself. And also, uh, many of Josh's friends from, from far away also here to join him um, as he takes this step into uh, a new phase of his role in the academy, uh, becoming a doctor of PhD. So this is a long time coming. Um, but I think for those who are on his committee, I'd like to thank uh, Maria Perez. Um, I'd like to thank Cheryl Brown. Um, I'd like to thank Trevor Harris. And of course, uh, Adam Pine, who's joining us from the uh, University of Minnesota Duluth, um, and Karen Kulkasi. Is Karen here? Um, we, uh, about two years ago, uh, met in a room just like this, um, and Josh presented a very ambitious research project, um, incredibly ambitious. Um, as you can see from the title, Hunger, Capitalism, and Humanitarian Reason, just a few things he's been thinking about over the last uh, couple of years. I um, mean, this is an opportunity for us to engage with that work as an audience um, and to ask questions and to learn more from Josh. Um, and there's two, sort of a two-fold purpose for today. The first is a public presentation. We'll all uh, be able to join in and enjoy that together um, and ask Josh some hard questions. Um, and then after the public presentation, um, we'll invite everyone to leave uh, who are not a member of the uh, internal committee. Um, and we will uh, meet together and uh, that's when the grilling begins. Um, just that's when the harder questions are uh, or the discussion and conversation begins with Josh and his most intimate advisors. So um, at that time, we'll ask everyone, invite everyone to leave. And, um, and so that will be in just a little while. But to start, I just want to say, uh, again, uh, congratulate Josh on reaching this point. Um, and uh, welcome everyone who's here today uh, to Josh's defense. And I'm going to turn it over to Josh to get started. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you, Josh. Um, so Bradley, I try not to cry as I give this because I tend to cry when I'm overtired for one, which I am, and uh, at big moments. And this is a big moment for them because a bunch of people are in the room that I love. Some fun connections are made. I saw Dr. Harris and Dr. Charlotte pitching up. And uh, this interweaving of worlds, uh, Park and Mercedes have never met. So, it's great. Um, just get the crying out now. <laughs> I want to thank, um, yeah, all of those who've been a part of me on this research journey. Food bank, food charity, everyone that I met and helped me learn about hunger and responsibility. I want to thank my committee, obviously, who's just been there throughout the ups and downs and doubts and whatnot. Um, and then I I want to thank my family that is here <laughs> also representing my different kids. We've got through a lot. We will do this. Glad I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, the title of my talk is The Food Bank Fix Hunger, Capitalism, and Humanitarian Reason. Uh, it is an ambitious title that I wrestled with until two in the morning last night. <laughs> and I kept wondering why did I give it this title instead of something else. Um, but I think, I hope it'll be meaningful for all of you and for whoever comes across you. So off the National Mall in Washington, DC, five men wait for their portion of food in front of a closed door. The sculptures commemorate the Great Depression that left millions dependent on food aid to survive. Juxtaposed with this feeding line, the statues of two disheveled farmers 
Recollect the overproduction and commodity price collapse that shattered the lives of agrarian families during the same period. Bread lines knee deep in wheat provoked a sense of moral outrage that New Deal food policies sought to mitigate by purchasing farm excess and distributing it as hunger relief. The feeding line memorial reverberates into our present. Indeed, 46 million people continue to line up for free food across the United States every month. In July 2014, 200 people were gathered in the Parsley Bottom Free Will Baptist Church in West Virginia to wait for the arrival of a food truck carrying pallets of USDA commodities and a load of private donations recovered from a Walmart superstore. Within two hours, each family had received an allocation of free food from the food bank staff and volunteers organizing the line. Free food distributions like these are known in food banking circles as mobile food pantries, and they're happening in some form all around the country. In many ways, this distribution in Parsley Bottom is reminiscent of humanitarian food drops that occur elsewhere in the world, in refugee camps and disaster zones. Feeding lines resolve two problems. First and most obviously, they respond to food access failures at the household level. In the United States, feeding lines are a testament to the disaster of a deeply unequal society and the failure of a politics of austerity that drives millions of people into a permanent state of emergency. Secondly, and perhaps much less obviously, feeding lines resolve problems of overproduction in the capitalist food system. They offer a convenient vent for the food waste generated by agro-industrial supply chains. Unlike the 1930s, feeding lines in the context of food gluts no longer provoke a sense of moral outrage. Today, they exist instead of sites of moral performance, blunting the injustices of a highly unequal society and normalizing a food system that segments eaters along lines of disposable income. Janet Poppendick frames the growth and social acceptance of food charity in the 1980s and 90s as a, quote, moral safety valve for a society coming to grips with the fallout of dismantling the welfare state on the altar of neoliberal capitalism. Food charity, she argued, produces a set of values that depoliticize poverty through an overt focus on solving hunger through food waste recovery. And since her critique was leveled 20 years ago, the amount of food waste recovered and redistributed by food banks in the U.S. has increased fivefold. In 2016, four and a half billion pounds of food was diverted through a network of 200 food banks and their 60,000 local food charity affiliates all across the country. As you can see, even as recent food insecurity rates are decreasing, food banks are drawing up strategic plans to significantly increase their capacity to recover and distribute more food investing in new infrastructure to accommodate projected growth in food waste donations by both the public and private sectors. The dramatic expansion of food banking in the U.S. and globally has raised alarm bells among scholars concerned about the growing reliance of food insecure households on the basis of short-term emergency food relief. Yet as I argue in this dissertation, concerns about the limits of food banking to address poverty and nutritional disparities obscures a less visible dynamic at work. The problem of agro-industrial overproduction and the supply side factors driving the growth of the food banking economy. The frenetic work of revaluing food waste as hunger relief is raising some hard questions. Who is benefiting from increases in these flows? Where are these foods coming from? Where are they going? And how are they accessed by the different parties involved in the gift transaction? In this dissertation, I developed the concept of the food bank fix to theorize the paradoxical relationships between the state, the shadow state, food corporations, local food chairs, and food banks that tie these humanitarian food networks together. I argue that food banks damp the grinding contradictions of a society awash in food surpluses, even as a significant proportion of the population remains at risk of hunger. To buttress this argument, I analyzed the geographic process through which the moral impulse of those working to resolve crises of overproduction and manufacturing food scarcity for a globalized and increasingly integrated food system. 
sorry, that moral impulse is subordinated to institutional logics that resolve crises of overproduction and manufacture food scarcity. My manuscript is structured into eight chapters to reinforce this point. Chapter two is a literature review that develops the food bank fix as my theoretical contribution to geography and food studies. Chapters three through six take a deep dive into each node of the humanitarian food network. And chapter seven unpacks some of the tensions and contradictions that emerge within this assemblage as the institutional distance between national organizations governing charitable food flows grind up against a locally diverse group of charitable organizations to revalue industrial food waste through hunger relief. My concluding chapter reflects on the food bank fix, proposing ways that food charities might take advantage of slippages and pressure points within this humanitarian assembly to further food justice and food sovereignty. Ones that do not rely on logics of scarcity. So I developed these ideas about the food bank fix in West Virginia, a state weathering along investment decline, where jobs in extractive and manufacturing sectors are being replaced by lower wage and off temporary service work. With some of the highest unemployment and poverty rates in the country, West Virginia has a 20% food hardship rate, meaning at least once over a 12 month period, 350,000 people can't eat food. In this context, food charities are under tremendous pressure to provide food, even as they are themselves largely under-resourced as compared to their counterparts in the country. I draw on a five-year institutional ethnography of humanitarian food networks in the state to understand this food banking economy. My research began at the local food charity scale here in Morgantown, in Mon County, and moved toward the regional food banks. Because access to food and financial resources within this network extend far beyond state borders, my inquiry also led outside of West Virginia. I surveyed 550 local charities through the West Virginia Food Bank three times, interviewed over 60 actors involved in charitable food sourcing and distribution, participated in dozens of planning and advocacy meetings from rural church basements to lavish hotel conference rooms. I conducted interviews with federal bureaucrats working on USDA commodity procurement, food industry representatives selling food to the US government, and Feeding America employees engaged in corporate food sourcing partnerships. I also attended three national conferences that drew charitable food actors from across the country together to collaborate on anti-hunger strategies. Participant observation and interview opportunities at these meetings, along with archival data collected over the course of the research process, provided insights into the wider institutional dynamics facing the humanitarian food network in the United States, in West Virginia in particular. Food charities in West Virginia serve 300,000 people every month. That's 16% of the state's population. Facing Hunger Food Bank serves 12 counties in the Southwest. Mountaineer Food Bank serves 48. The two food banks processed a combined 18 million pounds of food in 2016, a number that doubled in less than a decade. They have 550 local food charity affiliates whose medium operating budget is a mere $12,500, so about $1,000 a month. The variable capacity of these different organizations to raise funds leads to uneven professionalization across the network. 35% of these charities employ at least one part-time staff member, but the remainder manage their feeding programs solely through the 16,000 volunteers mobilized to prepare, serve, and account for food and people throughout the state. So how did such a vast network come to exist? Why has it become a key part of the social safety net in the United States? And what are the implications for understanding the geography of food and agriculture more broadly? I turn to my literature review to develop the broad strokes of the food banking. And this is what I've been thinking about, so bear with me. Hunger is not exceptional to capitalism, but part of it. Indeed, it's one of the biological drivers that compel all of us to enter wage relationships. The history of the modern food system can be read through the evolving social response to its feeding life as these fixed contradictions inherent to the production of food scarcity. Mike Davis argues that the British colonial project disrupted moral economies. 
in South Asia, producing vulnerabilities to hunger and widespread famine that precipitated emergent nations into global market relations. In the British metropole, hunger was a problem facing rapidly urbanizing society. James Vernon explains how new networks of power formed around solutions to hunger, crystallizing into state and supranational food institutions that then themselves wielded power and control over the future direction of our food system. Today, this power is shared with agro-industrial food concerns who are increasingly part of an anti-hunger solutioning through market-based approaches to nutrition entitlement. The institutionalization of food charity must be understood within these power networks. Food banks first emerged as a charitable strategy to distribute surplus food to the poor in the 1970s. As the state cut welfare and other social services in the 1980s, charitable giving filled the gap. These voluntary responses to hunger relief intersected with the goals of both the state and food corporations. Jen Papendick again recounts how this phenomenon became institutionalized, quote, because it fits so well into the agendas of other powerful institutions, particularly government and business. Food banks and charitable food more broadly remain a fraught phenomenon, but how they work to achieve institutional legitimacy is still poorly understood. I argue that the hidden links between profit and compassion-driven supply chains have legitimized these institutions in society. Links I make explicit throughout my dissertation. Charitable hunger relief provides a profitable vent for state subsidized and corporate food waste. Andy Fisher links food charity to a quote, anti-hunger industrial complex that serves entrenched agro-food interests. Geographers frame food banks as parastatal institutions that resolve crises of overaccumulation in the capitalist food system by consolidating power across a fractured anti-hunger landscape. My research extends these findings by analyzing ruling relations beyond the food, those that shape and regulate emergency food networks as a viable secondary circuit of accumulation that enclose food waste as compulsory gifts. We have to give this food away. We can't sell it. This form of food waste revaluation through hunger relief did not emerge in a vacuum. Rather, the institutionalization of food charity emerged within a specific set of social relationships over time under capital. I couch this argument in food regime theory developed by Friedman and McMichael. The main thrust of their argument is that crises of accumulation in the capitalist food system produce transformation and transitions to new food regimes. The first food regime came to a crisis point after World War I, when European colonies began to gain independence and the global economy was restructured through Keynesian economics. By the end of World War II, a new food regime took hold based on competition in a bipolar world where surplus food was wielded as a political weapon to lure newly independent states into spheres of economic influence. At the dawn of the neoliberal era in the 1980s, saw the emergence of a corporate food regime that's now trending toward the consolidation of power with an agro-industrial and large retail arms. Multinational networks now control agricultural inputs, seeds, fertilizer, etc., set the terms of farming contracts, and influence prices to extract as much profit from food as possible for their private shareholders. Now, the moral drive to fix hunger under the corporate food regime is intimately tied to the evolving politics of humanitarian reason. Barnett and Fassin explain how responses to human suffering are organized through a constellation of actors that include supranational institutions, states, foundations, NGOs, political donors, relief workers, and even the victims. Humanitarian interventions create institutional distance and misaligned motivations between people and organizations. The rules that structure the management of precarious lives then come to occupy a key position in our contemporary moral order, whereby the suffering and misfortune of victims supplants concerns about inequality and injustice. The moral practice of humanitarianism developed alongside the modern capitalist state. 
As a key instrument of the international order, humanitarian expressions have closely mirrored the crises that led to food regime transitions. Today, the food bank fix resolves ongoing crises in our food system by filling the space between surplus and scarcity. So that was my theoretical framework. And um, I'm just going to take a deep breath and try to not read anymore. Because <laughs> I know it's heavy um, to take in and to process and to think about, well, how does this relate to me giving a can to my little How does it relate to me trying to work to solve hunger? So what we're going to do now is just try to unpack how the emergency food network in West Virginia works and re relate it back to this food bank fix concept. So scholarship on charitable food has tended to not include the state. Uh, it hasn't done so because food banks and charities are often thought of as a response to a receding state. Right? We cut SNAP, we cut WIC, we cut school meal programs, and hope food pantries fill the void. But what I'm arguing is that the state is actually an active participant in the rollout of state-driven humanitarian fix centered on the Emergency Food Assistance Program, or TFAP. So the TFAP fix began in the 1980s under Reagan. Reagan cut welfare, cut nutritional entitlement programs, cut public housing, and all of a sudden there were feeding lines emerging all across the country. People were going up to churches and saying, do you have any food for me? And these lines were growing. But at the same time, some reporters got wind of government cheese rotting in warehouses in caves in the Midwest. And this created a sense of, hey, if we have all of this surplus cheese, we should give it to all these hungry people. And Reagan, flamboyantly in 1981, right after he got elected, said, I am releasing the government cheese. <laughs> Everything will be fine. This is a temporary fix. Everything will come into order once trickle-down economics starts working. But what we see after 1980 is actually a spike in these TFAP allocations over time. Now, there's two types of TFAP food. There's entitlement food, which is legislated in the farm bill. It's a tiny slice of nutritional entitlement, but it packs a really good punch. And then you have bonus foods, these that are constantly fluctuating at the whims of um, agricultural surplus. Now, TFAP is not given to food banks. It's given to states. So states administer these commodities and then contract with their food banks to distribute them. So the West Virginia Department of Agriculture is also a key player in this process and has leeway to distribute these monies and commodities as it sees fit. There are about 350 TFAP certified agencies in our state. Those are agencies that have the certification process to say, yes, I have the refrigeration capacity. Yes, I uh, have the staff capacity to do the paperwork and monitor um, this program. And they get access to this very high quality nutritionally vetted food from the federal government. As you can see, um, TFAP distributions are highly uneven across our state. Right? There's no logical rollout to where this TFAP food is going. So it begs the question, is this really an entitlement to solve hunger? If I get SNAP, I can go spend that at whatever grocery store I want in the country. But TFAP, if I don't have a car, it's really hard sometimes to access that food. So again, I see this as reinforcing the argument that this program is not really about solving hunger. It's about redistributing surplus products. Now, rules associated with program participation expand or limit the right to this nutritional entitlement in different places, too. There's a lot of talk about TFAP rules. Okay? People do not like TFAP because of the rules that are expanding. Rules have gone from a few pages to a book. I mean, how much can you burden volunteers with this? 
I volunteered for a lot of things before, but one thing's for sure, I've never volunteered to do paperwork. All right, so these rules in place are burdensome, but I also argue that they're important because they guarantee a modicum of a right to food. You can't turn anyone away because of their gender, their race, their sexuality, the way they speak English. TFAP foods belong to the USDA. It's not your food, it's the federal government's. Also, we appreciate that you're churches and you work hard, but no prayer. You can't bless the government food. Because often churches say, yeah, come into the service, pray with me. And they don't give you food. So this is a tension within the network, right? So that's TFAP, a modicum of civil rights. Unlike the other large institution regulating food surplus in the food banking economy, Feeding America is a parastatal institution. Um, they organize private food waste flows across the humanitarian food network. Now this organization has grown from humble beginnings in the Phoenix area to becoming the third largest nonprofit in the United States. It's a highly professionalized tier of the shadow state. And it certifies 200 food bank affiliates all across the country. The agglomeration of large food donors under the Feeding America umbrella paralleled the construction of a legal framework that incentivized food businesses to donate their obsolete inventories to charity. These private firms directly influence the framing of hunger relief causes, zero waste initiatives, nutrition education programs, and infrastructure improvements to the national network. In the process, these companies save on reduced disposal fees, they boost their image as good corporate citizens, and they collectively claimed over $2 billion in tax relief last year. These are some of the most profitable corporations in the world that don't need to pay taxes because they give their waste to the hungry. Now, Feeding America doesn't actually handle any of this food. The product it secures from private donors is taken through an accounting technique known as variance power, meaning they own that product until it goes through the entire nonprofit pipeline into a hungry belly. And that's important because then they can say how that product is wielded on its journey from donation to receipt. And a key legal provision is that this food cannot be sold. You can't sell it 10 cents on the dollar. No, 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 no free market economics here. You have to gift it. Same as TFAT, by the way. You cannot sell TFAT food. Now there's a contradiction there, right? We want market-based solutions to hunger, but please don't be inventive and entrepreneurial in the way that you use this food waste. Keep it locked into these channels. Another thing about food banks is that they're obliged to report the number of pounds they receive from Feeding America. They must often accept whatever foods are donated. Often these are not nutritionally dense foods. There's no USDA saying, yeah, that's somewhat nutritious. The Feeding America Contracts defines the terms of the relationship between national, regional, and local food charities. While the brand provides access to large amount of food, food banks have to comply with policies ranging from financial record keeping and food safety to board governance and the trademark use of the Feeding America name. The contract also delimits each food bank's service territory, spatially ordering and disciplining these food bank members amongst themselves. It also compels members to count the food through a, a metric called meals per person in need. And I'll get back to that in a bit. Like the USDA, I mentioned Feeding America forbids food banks to sell. And uh, the certification process is wrapped into institutional power dynamics. They can cut off the food. If you don't comply with these rules, no more Walmart pickups. No more access to the Kellogg's factory. All right, so there's power there. There's power to be able to cut off the supply of food. And that power is yielded. Next come the food banks. They're caught up in the middle of all of this. The central nodes of this humanitarian food network. They negotiate tensions between those national institutions organizing the distribution of food and then the grassroots anti-hunger groups um, trying to address food access problems in their communities. But food banks do all of this in an extremely frenetic environment. Funding 
is the first major obstacle facing food banks, especially those in West Virginia. Um, the two food banks in West Virginia hire combined about 35 people full time to move food around. There's a $3.8 million budget to run these organizations. So they're not small, right? They're actually major food hubs with trucks coming in and out every day, accounting needs, buying diesel, buying refrigeration, paying electric bills. But fundraising and paying for this is a constant puzzle. And they're constantly operating at their financial limits, robbing Peter to pay Paul. As you see in this graph, there's private funding, which is from foundations and donors, and it's the largest chunk. Then comes the TFAP funding. Now, TFAP food is about 40% of the food circulating through. Our government only gives about 20% of uh, its administrative cost to the food bank. And then network funding, almost a million dollars is the money coming from below. Those local food charities and churches and church alms that are paying into this network to secure food. So this is frenetic. But added to that are frenetic and constantly changing food sources. Okay, the USDA commodities that come are very ad hoc. A couple months ago, they got a bunch of fresh milk. There's figs on the list. Soon there's going to be frozen pork, but they don't exactly know when the truck is going to show up. And then at the retail level, you never quite know what you're going to get. Am I going to get a whole bunch of frozen beef or Cheetos? Okay, and they have to make do with this freneticism. As you can see in 2008, there was a massive spike in West Virginia. And that happened due to a reorganization of agroindustrial supply chains when retailers were all of a sudden the places where waste was generated. And I can talk about that more later. Um, and then the final source of freneticism within this food banking economy is the accounting and reporting and the monitoring and compliance. Accounting comes from below. Give us your numbers. Tell us how much food you picked up from that Walmart. How many people did you serve? And for a food charity that's just trying to help, it's really annoying especially when you're a volunteer-based organization. Nobody's paying you to do this. And somebody comes and says, give me your numbers. It creates frustration, tension. And then from above, there's all this monitoring and compliance. Chad Morrison just came out of two months. He's the director of the Mountaineer Food Bank. Two months of auditing. All right, from the USDA, from Feeding America, they come and check. Is everything clean? Is everything okay? Are you actually doing what you're saying that you're doing? And all they want to do is help, but they're constrained by this constant oversight. And that oversight comes from Feeding America and the USDA. So a quote that sums this up well is um, a food bank worker that said to me, only those working in food banking really understand the type of work that we're doing every day. There's no good way to communicate all that I do. It just doesn't make much sense. Turning to local food charities, they're the ends of this vast supply chain. But most of them don't understand their place within a vast revaluation network that extends through the food bank into the state, the shadow state, and the wider market-driven food system. They don't understand the concepts around the production of scarcity, right? And LFCs often operate in the shadows. Visible in their public appeals for food donations and cans and funding, but tucked away from the public eye in church basements and low income community centers. They're not very visible parts of our food economy, even though 16% of our population uses them. Why is that? The number of food charities has expanded drastically following the supply of available foods. The trend line pretends to steady growth for this mode of food delivery in the coming years. But these LFCs can't be understood as franchises rolled out with any inherent logic, spatial or otherwise, as I've said. They're not unitary subjects. Their everyday practices, meanings, and performances vary as the collective spirit of the volunteer staff differs from place to place. I heard multiple times throughout the course of my research, if you've been to one food pantry in West Virginia, You've been to one food pantry in West Virginia. 
So there are a lot of different types of local food charities. The three broad categories of school backpack programs provide meals for uh, children after school on weekends and vacation. Congregate meals, those are hot meal programs that are often open five, seven days a week that I can go and get a hot meal. And then food pantries that are more like grocery stores that you can only access once a month, maybe once every other month. And these vary in terms of how many people they serve and how many agencies are across the state. The food bank has to deal with this diversity. And it also has to deal with uneven development across the network. And the darker shades of green are the richer counties. Simon County is quite wealthy compared to some of its neighbors. And in the red dots are how much money is spent per person at a food charity. So you can see in Mon County, if you go to a food charity, you're pretty well taken care of. Pocahontas, less so. So there's uneven development across this network, which again begs the question, is it really solving hunger? If, chair, if um, people living in poor counties have less access to nutritious food, is this really solving hunger? Um, food charities are also complex because they want to source their own food. They want to spend their own money. But the food bank, again, needs to push all of this food out. Um, you can see food banks distribute about 40% of the overall supply of emergency food in the state. And local food charities got um, the rest through local donations and local purchases. This is also highly uneven if you look at the maps closely. Under-resourced places tend to rely on the food bank more. But the food bank, again, needs to get those metrics out, needs to show that it's feeding a lot of people. But it's not allowed to count these pounds. It can only count these pounds. So the food bank would like to capture more of this. One food bank director said, I asked my agencies, how much do you all want to pay for peanut butter? But they don't want to give me that kind of power for some reason. It takes a lot of education to help them understand that we're offering this because we're all in this together. But what they're also starting to think about is tiering their agencies. Which ones are the high capacity agencies that I can push a lot of food through? These smaller agencies, they're taking a whole bunch of my time. So does the food bank solve hunger? Ideologies also play an important role at the local level, right? Um, the amount of times you can access food, where you can access it, um, come into play, um, as I said, and, and these ideologies frustrate the food bank base. There are some charities that will just give food away to anybody that walks through the door. There's other charities that say, mm, you were here two weeks ago, weren't you? And didn't you go to that other food pantry? Do you really need food? Right? And they're trying to discipline their poor. The final um, kind of data analysis chapter is about overcoming these, these barriers and frictions. The local food charity scale is actually the most significant barrier to profitability for large food firms and the federal government using charity to bring value. The humanitarian food network is then developing these innovative strategies to try to overcome these barriers. Um, the Closing the Hunger Gap study um, tried to determine at the county scale, so more fine-grained than USDA data. Okay, this is where the, the shadow state comes in and comes up with some really, really good analysis and data that the federal government doesn't even have. To pinpoint exactly how much food to drop in each county in order to measure success. Right? This is called the meals per person in need metric. But that metric is also going up along with the supply of food. So we constantly need to be dumping more food into these under-resourced counties. If you don't comply, if you don't meet the standard in one of these counties, then you get a slap on the wrist. Get up, get up your game, food bank, or we're going to cut your food off and give this opportunity to feed the hungry to someone else. So this adds to the freneticism. Yeah. And so the strategic responses by the food banks are, hey, let's enable our high capacity agencies to go to Walmart, to go to Kroger, to go to Aldi and pick up that food for us. And then we'll be able to count that food. But this also creates tensions at the local scale because, you know, food charities are seeing that 
Well, the Baptist church has access to the Walmart. And my Presbyterian church doesn't. And they don't want to share. And then that creates all these tensions and contradictions. And, um, and so these agency-enabled pickups are also problematic. And then there's the mobile food pantry, with which I opened up the, uh, the presentation. Right? Just drive a whole bunch of food and just drop it in a county so that it's not red anymore and it turns to green. These are some of the um, strategies that I talk about throughout the dissertation. And um, I'm just going to read my closing argument about food bank procedures because I want to get it right. So the local canned food drive that still occupies the social imaginary surrounding hunger relief in the United States is implicated in a powerful network of food system actors that contribute to the production of food scarcity under capitalism. Although food banks and their local food charities are largely perceived as organizations whose raison d'etre is to feed the poor, my institutional ethnography of humanitarian food networks in West Virginia has complicated this idea. My five data chapters reveal that surplus food transfers are tightly controlled by the state and large food corporations to ensure they do not disrupt the profit motives driving our food system forward. Food banking is not merely a response to hunger in situ. It is a geopolitical, ecological, and nutritional governance project that maintains the hegemony of the capitalist food system mm -hmm. under the banner of humanitarianism. Now, a fresh crisis last year served to confirm my theory of the food bank fix. As I was consolidating my analysis in February 2018, the Trump administration released a federal budget that would reduce supplemental nutrition assistance program spending by $213 billion over the next 10 years, a 30% cut. Now, because so many rely on SNAP benefits, the steep reductions had to be mitigated by some programmatic alternative. Enter America's hardest box a proposal to distribute 100% American-grown foods provided directly to households. The idea was met with moral outrage across the political spectrum. It was dead on the walk, dead, dead in the water. But the incitement to discourse around expanding commodity programs once again obscured the supply-side logics driving the concept. Food producers in the crosshairs of US isolationist policies were suddenly burdened by surpluses that no longer had a market. In July, an executive order released $12 billion of federal aid to bail out U.S. farmers caught up in retaliatory tariffs of an escalating trade war with China. 10% of that was earmarked for the purchase of surplus commodities that are now beginning to flood our food banking networks. A short timeline between the America's Harvest Box announcement and the tariff-related producer bailouts raise further questions about the policy links between the food bank fix and political economic pressures of a capitalist food system negotiating permanent crisis. No discussions are centering on the day when food banks may no longer be needed, raising further questions about their long-term role in solving hunger. So what about ending hunger? What would the food bank fix look like if it were not put to the service of the capitalist food system? We have to believe that it's possible to end hunger. That a fair food policy can ensure the right to nutritious food for all while working to restore an ecologically viable food system. It's still possible. Food charities shouldn't be discounted in their potential contributions to the food sovereignty movement. In fact, because they occupy such a central role in the moral economy of hunger relief, they're well positioned to confront corporate power in the food system in ways that many alternative food activists cannot. Food banks have the capacity to demand institutional changes to the status quo, but they cannot do so individually. Rather, a project that rewrites the call to charity toward food justice must work to build solidarities between food banks, local charities, volunteers, and local donors to push back against the monopolistic dynamics that limit their ability to contribute to transformative food system change. This will take risks. It will take sacrifices that go against the impulse to blindly solve hunger in the short term with the hope of gaining legitimate community food security in the long term. So in closing, I'll ask a few final questions that have surfaced for me over the course of this project that we can ponder together. 
What if food banks just stopped? What might that do to begin a new conversation about the roots of hunger and how to end it? What if they did not disappear, but intentionally refused to take part in the capitalist food system? What if the billions of dollars fixing the food economy in place and the millions of volunteer hours each year were reinvested into alternative food futures? What then? Let's imagine those possibilities. 